In today's lecture, we're going to talk about chromosomes. There's two objectives for today. First, I want to explain to you the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic chromosomes. And then second, we're going to focus on how eukaryotic chromosomes are packaged in a cell. So let's focus on this. When we talk about bacterial DNA, bacteria have one circular chromosome, and that's it. So the strand you see is circular. It is uh, double-stranded, right? In other words, it is a DNA double helix. Uh, but that's exactly what you would see in the center of a bacterial cell. In the center of a bacterial cell is something called the nucleoid region. Now, it wouldn't be open like that. It really would be more supercoiled, more compact. Uh, but this is what you see for bacteria uh, for their single chromosome. If we look at a scanning electron microscope image uh, of a uh, bacterium, and it's color-coded, uh, what you can see here is you see the DNA is highlighted in red. So you can see the DNA is sort of, you know, forming this, uh, this uh, supercoiled structure here. Uh, the proteins that are associated with DNA are depicted in yellow. And then you can see that the cell wall is actually stained in green here. Uh, all of these are artificial colors that are put on the, the image. When we talk about bacterial DNA, it is packaged. So what this slide is showing you is you have a single bacterium right here. And it's showing that if you opened up all the DNA and stretched it out, look how large of a surface area it covers. In other words, it wouldn't really fit inside the bacterium. But all of this is supercoiled, compact. Uh, bacterial DNA is, is um, you know, interacts with different bacterial proteins to sort of stabilize it and help uh, compact the DNA. And once you do compact it all, then you can fit inside of a bacterium. Now, interestingly enough, I have pr the word protein here. So proteins are associated with the bacterial DNA to compact them. In a second, we'll talk about eukaryotic DNA, and I'll use the word histone. Uh, bacteria don't have histones to our knowledge to date. So the, the proteins we're talking about are, are sort of, you know, similar proteins to histones, but not as complex. Let's turn our attention to eukaryotic chromosomes, and that's really what I want to focus on in today's lecture. I really want to focus on eukaryotes. So eukaryotes have linear chromosomes. You can see here that we have, uh, you know, a chromosome in front of you. Uh, it's linear. It's not circular. Though the ends of our chromosomes are circular, something sort of interesting. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Quick uh, question for you. What do you see in this picture? Sort of drawing upon, upon uh, previous knowledge. Do you see a pair of homologous chromosomes? Do you see four chromosomes? Do you see two sister chromatids? Do you see all of the above? Or do you see none of the above? So think about that for a second. What you'll notice is eventually you'll sort of notice, uh, if you draw upon prior knowledge, is we see one chromosome here. And you might look at it and say, how is that exactly one chromosome? In other words, I see a section here, I see a section here, section here, section here. Perhaps you might have said four, right? You might have said a pair of homologous chromosomes. In other words, maybe uh, this would be a pair, maybe this would be a pair. Uh, but in fact, that's not what we see at all. And you'll notice this as we go through the lecture. Uh, it's really a semantic point. It's like, well, you know, what does it matter what we call a chromosome? But when you think about it, it really does matter. We've got to know exactly what is one chromosome, what is two. Where is their origin? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from the mother, coming from the father? Are they duplicated, not duplicated? We've got to understand how to, how to name these so we know exactly what we're talking about. And so here what you do see is you actually see one chromosome. Now, that's not an answer choice here, so you can't pick that, right? But it's one duplicated chromosome. In other words, if this half of the chromosome right here is, let's say, we're talking about humans, let's say number 15 from the mother, what would this half be? Well, it would also be number 115, or sorry, 115, it'd be number 15 from the mother also, because this is one duplicated chromosome. So here is 15 from the mother, here is 15 from the mother also, but it's duplicated. When you have duplicated chromosomes like that, so you have one chromosome, but it's duplicated, we say each half is called a sister chromatid. So the correct answer here is three. You see two sister chromatids in this image. When we talk about eukaryotic DNA, it's extensively packaged. And so we've got to look at that here. This is really what we're going to focus on uh, throughout the rest of the lecture here. When you start in its most basic form, you see that we have a DNA double helix here. And you can see that uh, you know we have the double helix. When there's nothing associated with it, in other words, there's no proteins, uh, you know, no histone proteins associated, we say that the double helix is naked or bare. So this is a bare or naked double helix. It's good to know dimensions here, too. We're going to talk about a lot of dimensions in this lecture. And so I do want you to know these dimensions. Um, the width of a double helix um, is 2 nanometers. Right? If you look at the width this way. One turn of the double helix is about 10 nanometers. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, one turn of the double helix is 3.4 nanometers. And one turn of the double helix is also 10 base pairs, if you count the base pairs, where I got the number 10 from. 
Uh, so you really do want to know these dimensions. It helps put things in perspective. So here we have naked DNA. If you go ahead and coil it further, you can see that here it starts to coil around these spheres. So these spheres, we give them names. We call the sphere itself, what it is is a bunch of histone proteins, and we call it a nucleosome core. So the circle itself, the thing that looks like a little basketball here, uh, that's in purple, we call it the nucleosome core. Once we wrap DNA around it, this is the first level of compaction of eukaryotic DNA, once we wrap DNA around it, then we say it's just a nucleosome. So the nucleosome core plus DNA, now we say it's a nucleosome. Once you add this extra protein on here, see this little yellow protein, if you look over here it says histone H1. Once we add that, then we call it a chromatosome. That's the structure we use, call it a chromatosome. And the dimension of the chromatosome, excuse me, is about uh, 11 nanometers in diameter. Now in a second we're going to zoom inside this sphere, and, and we're going to you know, talk about that further. But I want to show you one more thing here very quickly. So as, this is the first level of compaction. The DNA wraps around the nucleosome core about two times, almost two times. And then once we get to this next level of compaction, basically these things that we call beads on a string, sort of the structure we use, called beads on a string, those will further compact uh, amongst themselves. And we'll call these things uh, that they compact into further, we'll call them 30 nanometer fibers. That's the word that we use for that, so 30 nanometer fibers. Then after that we get higher levels of compaction, which you can view on this slide, but really I want you to focus on everything 30 nanometers and below. Those are the dimensions I want you to know. But you can see ultimately, once we get all the way up here, then we, full a, a, we form a fully formed chromosome. You could see that, what is this? This is one chromosome, believe it or not, but it's one duplicated chromosome. What you're seeing is a chromosome in metaphase. Okay, again, we'll talk about that further, but you want to know how to label these. So if I said, what do you see? Either you'd say one chromosome, or you would say two sister chromatids, which each sister chromatid is just the half, since it's a mirror image of the other half. Okay, let's zoom in further into the nucleosome core. If we look at the core more, uh, you know, a little more specifically here, you could see that the core is compo composed of um, four different types of histone proteins, and each histone protein um, each type, excuse me, has two of those uh, types of histones in, in, the, uh, in the nucleosome. So four types, two of each, gives you a histone octomer. In other words, octo in Greek means eight. So we have eight different total histones. But again, four types, two of each type. So what are the types? Well, we have H2A, and here's the other H2A. Second type is H2B. Here's the other H2B. We have two H3 histones and two H4 histones. Now, don't get confused on these names. You know, we have H2A, H2B, H3, H4. It seems a little confusing, all these different names. They're just names for proteins. That's all they are. Whenever you see um, anything, any type of protein, uh, whether it's you know histones or photosystems, when we talk about uh, photosynthesis in a different lecture, uh, whenever you see those types of things, uh, you might say, how do they get their numbering? Like, where do they come up with H2A, H2B, H3, H4? I can't say exactly, but, but in general, it's good to keep in mind that when uh, people discover these different proteins, either they're numbering them uh, based on the order in which they were discovered, or they could be numbered uh, in the order in which uh, people believe, or scientists believe, that they evolved. Usually that's the system, so there is some logic to all these random numbers. If we look further at this, we could see this is showing you how they form here. So in other words, what's the order that these, these different histones these four different types, again, eight total, right, because there's two of each type. How, what's the order in which they form? What this is showing you is that you'll have an H3 and an H4 come together to form a dimer. At the same time, you'll have an H2A and an H2B interacting to form a dimer. Dimer, dimer just means two protein subunits. Then you'll see that these uh, dimers come together to form a tetramer, and then eventually what's going to happen is you're going to have two tetramers interacting to form an octamer. And that's how we get that structure. This is just showing you that nucleosome core, right, the, the sphere itself, the histones itself, once you wrap the DNA around, then we say it's a nucleosome. And then once you add the H1 protein, which is a different histone, not part of the nucleosome core, but a different histone, then we call that whole thing a chromatosome. So a quick question for you again. How many bases of DNA are in direct contact with a histone protein? Well, you could sort of map this out, right? If I give you the diameter of a uh, histone, uh, or excuse me, the diameter of a, of a nucleosome core, uh, which is what we're talking about when we say histone proteins in this case. If 
I gave you that, I gave you the dimensions of a double helix, 10 base pairs in one turn. You could really sort of figure it out if you look at the cir circumference of that. Uh, if you go ahead and calculate that, you should come up with a number that's approximately 145 base pairs, sort of the answer. Again, it's good to have these dimensions in mind. Okay, let's look at the next level of compaction. We're going to here look at the 30 nanometer fibers. So nucleosomes are coiled further to form uh, 30 nanometer fibers. And this is a nice uh, electron microscope. In this case, it's a transmission electron microscope image showing you what these 30 nanometer fibers look like. This is the cartoon version of it. But it's just an extra level of compaction that happens. You can see how they're fitting. We're fitting all this DNA into these chromosomes and hence you know, compacting them to such a degree where they can, can possibly fit into a cell, uh, specifically the nucleus of a cell. But it takes a lot of compaction to get this to happen. So chromatin, when we look at it, uh, chromatin is just a different name for DNA. Uh, usually people call DNA chromatin when they're talking about DNA that's an interphase, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, it's mostly highly compact at, at metaphase. So when you see these compact chromosomes, you're looking at metaphase chromosomes. Eukaryotic chromosomes have things called centromeres, which is where the DNA is highly condensed, sort of at the middle of the chromosome. It doesn't have to be the middle. I'll show you in a second, but you know, sort of the middle there. They also have telomeres at the end of the chromosomes, and these telomeres help protect the integrity of the chromosomes. I think of them as like the little plastic part at the end of your shoelace. I think it helps protect the chromosome uh, from fraying, from degrading. And people think that telomeres are associated with aging. So they think as people age, their telomeres start to shorten, get degraded, and what happens is that helps contribute to people aging. So let's look at this a little bit further here. Here you see one chromosome on the left, you see one chromosome on the right. You might say, okay, that doesn't make sense. How do I see one chromosome here, one chromosome here, when there's double the material here as opposed to here? Again, we gotta say the whole label all the way through. So this is one unduplicated chromosome, and this is one duplicated chromosome composed of two sister chromatids. So that solves that, that conundrum. When we look at the centromere, we can see that there's little proteins in the middle of the centromere called kinetochores. And these little proteins are what the microtubules latch onto when chromosomes divide during mitosis. So the, um, the location of the centromere of a chromosome helps determine how the chromosome is classified. So the ones on the last slide, if we back up here, a eh, little off center, right? So we might call those sub-metacentric. If the, if the centromere is right in the middle of the chromosome, we call it metacentric. If it's really far to an end, we call it acrocentric. And um, if it's way at the end, we call it telecentric. Now, you could definitely tell the difference if you looked at a slide between telecentric and metacentric. But, you know, it might be hard if you had one given chromosome to say, is it specifically submetacentric or is it acrocentric? Unless you had two side by side, you know, a reference point. Um, not really important is my point. It doesn't really matter uh, if you can't tell exactly where it is. These are just general classifications. Centromeres are very important. Uh, they're highly compact uh, sections of DNA and they're very AT rich, these regions. Uh, they have a lot of repeating sequences. So they're not encoding for genes to our knowledge, right? But they're just places where the spindle apparatus can latch onto during mitosis. What this slide is showing you is you have one normal chromosome that has a centromere. It's duplicated, right? One duplicated chromosome. You have two chromosome fragments here that don't have a centromere. And all it's showing you is that if you don't have a centromere, you're in trouble because you need uh, centromeres on chromosomes for them to divide properly during mitosis. So here what you can see is you have anaphase happening, and you can see that uh, these uh, chromosomes, the bottom ones here that have the centromere, have the microtubules, or the, in other words, the spindle apparatus, latching on correctly. These don't. And you can see as it divides further, once um, you know the nucleus goes around or reforms around the chromosomes after uh, mitosis has taken place, you can see that the chromosomes that had centromeres are incorporated into the nucleus, whereas the ones that did not are lost, lost in the cytoplasm, plasm, excuse me, and eventually they're going to degrade. Uh, so just showing again that centromeres are required for mitosis. A uh, quick thing I want to point out here too is that you can see that these structures here, these little proteins at the end, these are called centrioles. So don't get them confused with centromeres that are here. Right? These are centrioles. Uh, and those are what um, the microtubules latch onto at the other end of the cell, at the pole of the cell. So one end they're latching on, you can see better in this picture, they're latching on at the, at the centromere, but the other end they're latching on at the centrioles. Chromosomes, as I mentioned before, also have telomeres. And what telomeres are is there's regions that are very... Um, 
Uh, we'll put it this way. At the end of the chromosome, we have this one strand that overhangs. We'll talk about this more when we talk about DNA replication. We have this one strand that overhangs. So this is our double helix. This is one chromosome, right? One double helix. If this strand overhangs. What happens is that it bends back over here and interacts uh, with the other strand. It's called strand invasion. And what happens is it forms something called a T-loop. And you can see that um, this T-loop, even though our chromosomes are linear, right? Most of them are linear. You can see that the ends of our chromosomes are circular in a sense, right? Circular DNA is always more stable than linear DNA, all things being equal. So this is what helps maintain the integrity of our telomeres at the end of our chromosomes. Chromato chromosomes can be composed of different types of DNA. Here we see heterochromatin. This is DNA that's not very d darkly stained. It's very open. It's very active DNA. At its extreme, when it's extremely active, we call it a chromosome puff. Here we have, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. <laughs> Scratch that, so rewind a second. So here's heterochromatin, right? Heterochromatin is the darkly stained DNA. So again, really dark sections here. This is DNA that's not very active. So it's not very active at all. Um, you have more stain per unit area, since it's so compact, right? It's not active, that's why we call it heterochromatin. Okay, now let's talk about the euchromatin. Euchromatin is more active DNA. It's opened up more for you know transcription, uh, replication, those types of things, really more transcription. And so you can see that you have euchromatin here, and uh, euchromatin means good chromatin, and these contain genes that are very active, that are undergoing transcription. All the light sections of DNA here, these lighter ones, are where you have euchromatin. At its extreme, so I misspoke earlier, right? At its extreme, you have something called a chromosome puff. In other words, extremely, extremely active DNA that's being transcribed at a high rate. There's other things on DNA uh, that help open them up and close them. So um, the histones themselves, you'll notice uh, soon in our, in our future lectures, the histones themselves have tails that latch out and grab the DNA and squeeze the DNA and open it up. And so um, the way um, the histones know whether to open up or close, not an intentional process, obviously. I use the word no just sort of, you know, just casually. But the way they know to, to open up is uh, sometimes uh, histones will be acetylated. Their tails will be um, modified with an acetyl group, a functional group. And so what happens is when they're acetylated, they typically, the answer is they typically open up. This is just a general rule of thumb. It's not always true. It depends which tail is acetylated, which amino acid on the histone tail is acetylated. Uh, it's very, very complex, actually. But in general, they open up. On the other hand, if you're going to have uh, histone tails that uh, close, uh, usually the, the functional group that's added to make them close is a functional group called methyl, so they're methylated. This whole field is something referred to as epigenetics, uh, modification of uh, the compaction of chromosome, which affects whether genes are transcribed or not. It's a very important topic that we'll talk about later on uh, in this course. So chromosomes can be stained, and we can line them up using a computer program, and we can um, form something called a karyotype, or some people call it a karyogram. And all this is saying is you're checking to see, does somebody have all the chromosomes they should have? Do they have 23 pairs? Uh, and are the right chromosomes in the right pair? And so you could see here that, you know, this is a male because it's XY. It has two pairs of each chromosome, uh, so it's in good shape. And um, you can notice that there's no trisomy going on here. Sometimes what will happen is you'll have chromosome 21, chromosome 18, where there's trisomy. And what happens is uh, those things can, uh, especially 21, can result in things like Down syndrome. There's another type of phenomena used to detect whether we have a certain DNA sequence. And this is something called fish. So whenever we have fish, what this means is we have a single-stranded piece of DNA, and we attach it to something called either a fluorophore Actually, usually we'll stick with that. It's called a fluorophore. And so what happens is you buy a piece of DNA from a biotech company, you design the sequence, you'd make it whatever sequence you want it to be, but you make it so it's complementary to the sequence you're trying to detect in the cell. So the whole point of FISH, and FISH stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization, the whole point is you're doing something called chromosome painting. You want to see, is a sequence of DNA uh, present in your cell or not? Either it's a disease sequence, or it's um, you know a sequence of DNA that you're interested in studying, just a general variant. But you buy a piece of DNA from the store, right? You buy a fluorophore, and when you introduce that DNA into a cell, it's going to hybridize to the to the sequence you're hoping to det detect, and the fluorophore will fluoresce. 
And so you could say that, oh, whatever sequence of DNA had the red fluorophoron it, that is, you know, in this part of the cell. Whatever one had the green is in this part of the cell. Uh, it's a very neat technique, not an easy technique to do, actually. Uh, There's a lot of controls you have to run with it, but, you know, it's a very interesting technique to detect a gene of interest in your cell or a variant in your cell. Uh, the uh, piece of DNA with a fluorophore that you design and you purchase from a biotech company, uh, together that whole thing is called a probe. Okay, finally just want to review here a little bit about human chromosomes. So we said that uh, humans have 23 types of chromosome. Uh, this slide says 24. I throw that in there just to remind you that some people classify X and Y differently. So they're saying X is the 23rd type, Y is possibly the 24th type. That's why uh, I mentioned 24, but, but most people don't say that. People usually assume X and Y are the sex chromosomes and they leave them as a pair and they, just, they leave it like that. So most people say 23, but I just wanted to bring this to your attention. Some people do say 24. The average size of the chromosomes, number of genes per chromosome, uh, gene size, distance between genes. Um, none of these are information that you have to memorize, except for the first bullet point. You want to know 23 pairs, right? That's what most people say, 23 pairs. You want to know that. Everything else just sort of FYI. Um, the reason I don't want you to memorize it is because you can really see that the numbers are highly variable when you look at them. And, and uh, you know, so it's just a general rule of thumb to give you a general idea. Okay, so this is the lecture on chromosome 